Okay, we're recording. Okay, great. Um, so for our, <laughs> we're going to try to do something a little bit uh, unusual today for the research meeting. We do have a couple of uh, t things to talk about, but uh, we released our recording of the research meeting on Monday, uh, where Jeff talked about mini columns and representing kind of movement uh, spaces and flows. Um, and there are a couple of really good comments on the on the YouTube channel. So what we thought we'd do as an experiment is we'll kind of read out the comments and we'll try to respond live to them um, and let's see what happens. And then we'll switch to talking about uh, the, the actual topics we had wanted to do. So uh, maybe we can scroll down to the one, I think it was by Elias. Um, yeah, and then I, I like this one because it says I agree with Subutai. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. So what it says, say? I think. Mine, it, go ahead. Do you want me to read it, or Marcus? Do you want to read it out loud, or? Um, uh, sure, I can read it. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, sure, I'll just read it. I have, I have not read this comment yet, so this will be new to me. Uh, this was great. I really liked listening to, listening to Jeff's new ideas. I agree with Subutai that it's still pretty difficult to grasp what these spaces look like or how they are updated. I thought it might be worthwhile to state my interpretation in case it clears up anything. Sorry if I'm just stating the obvious or making things more confusing, though. My interpretation, my That's interpretation my job, is That's my job, by the that, way. My job is to make things more confusing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my That's what we do most of the time. <laughs> Sorry. It, my, my interpretation is that a set of mini columns represent a position in some space, such as physical space and, and rotation. Each mini column represents the position along one basis vector. These are not regular vectors, though, since instead of representing the amount traveled in a linear direction, they can also represent things such as the amount rotated, et cetera. Yeah, that was so just stopping there for a second. That yeah. was the idea that I basically brought up on Monday. Just to read it right. I think so. His interpretation what, is uh, not incorrect. Yeah, I think it's right. Yeah, I think part of what makes this confusing is the terminology. Although Jeff calls these movement spaces or movement directions, it does not mean that the mini columns represent movements. Instead, I think he means that these basis vectors themselves are learned through movement flow. Each well, mini column. Know. Go on. But, well, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, the way the way I view this is, if you see a complex cell firing at some rate in a mini column, it means that that, that moment, there's that movement occurring. So uh, the activity of a complex cell in mini column would represent movement and the, act, act, the spiking rate would represent the speed of that movement. This is, remember going back, this is what was required for doing the voltage control oscillators for the grid cell module um, in theory. So I'm not sure I agree with that, but um, I, I think the nomenclature is confusing. So I don't have, you know, so that tip, it, that is typical early on in an idea phase like this is you have, you just don't know what to call things. So I would agree with that. But I, I think, the, I think the mini columns, they represent a lot of things. They don't just represent one thing. But when we think about complex cell activity, I think that means that that moment there was movement in, in some, some dimension. Okay. And it is learned okay. from flow. It, it's also learned from flow and it's also driven by flow. I think it's both. Uh, continue reading. Each mini column learns to uniquely associate with some particular flow from the input. Also, when such flow is received, the mini columns able to update and perform path integration. If we have uh, n different, go on. Yeah, I think that's consistent with what I just said. So maybe I misinterpreted it earlier. Okay, if we on. have n different mini columns, they will be associated with the n most common flow patterns. Yep. Sh sure. Yeah. Uh, the the hope is that these will then represent an overcomplete basis of the entire space that should be modeled. Correct. Uh, and then he goes on. I still don't understand how this could work in practice when the dimensions are dependent on each other, though. For example, the rotate right and forward vectors are clearly not independent. If I go forward two steps, turn around, rotate 180 degrees, forward, so on, uh, turn around again. Uh, I should end up in my original position, but the encoding would go from zero, zero to four, 360. Uh, I could also go forward three steps, turn around, go forward one step, turn around again. Uh, this would also leave me with the encoding for 360, but I would be in another place in physical space. I assume Jeff has some good solution to that problem though. All right, so so uh, I don't understand it either. And, um, but that's typical at this 
days. Um, I think what's exciting to me is, is not that I have a solution to these problems, but we've been working on these problems for a long time. People, you know, we should understand that it's not understood how grid cells do this either. You know, in the classic view of grid cells, it, it, we know that they do do this, but we don't know how. You don't know how it actually, you know, spaces are encoded and, and how we do uh, coordinate transforms and all this kind of stuff. So I think what's exciting to me is there's a new way of thinking about it. Um, and I have some ideas on how this might get resolved, um, but I don't have a solution yet. So the, the, that's the nature of these research meetings is that you find a way of attacking a problem, a new way of attacking a problem. And that itself is exciting because it might lead you to an answer. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would agree. I don't understand it either. And for, so the, reason, I, for the reasons you said. <laughs> yeah, and, and can I throw a kind of a spatial pooler uh, viewpoint on this? Uh, I'm not saying I, I know the answer to this, but in the spatial pooler, you know, you always have things that quite often you have, to, uh, back, you know, basis vectors, quote unquote, that are dependent on each other. In fact, that's what's the definition of an overcomplete basis is, is you have these things that are dependent on each other. And in the spatial pooler, it's not any one thing that represents the quantity. It's kind of the combined, the, the set of winning mini columns that, that kind of represent. And when you look at the full set, they're representing one thing or you know, maybe sometimes a couple of things uniquely. But in this case, it might be sort of one, uh, one direction. So at least in the spatial, if you look at the full set of S, full SDR from the spatial pooler, it kind of gets around this. I don't know if that's the solution. Does it, one, does it get around a, it? I mean, it, it, that's just as the vectors are not independent, but does it solve the sort of overall path integration problem? Um, that this, Well, you know, if, you're, if, if there really is one kind of movement under, uh, if there really is a single movement coming in or, or being experienced, then the SDR will be kind of unique to that uh, movement. It will uniquely tell you what, even though the individual Many columns might be dependent on each other. Huh. Um, uh, I'm curious. Is that you think that could solve this issue? I mean, I know. I, this, I, this, I, I don't know. It just seems relevant. Um, yeah. But it would mean we would have to look at the entire SDR and do operations based on the entire SDR rather than each mini column independently. I mean, I think it's interesting. This question goes back to when we first started talking about uh, grid cells like, several years ago. Um, we were sort of getting into depth and I don't know four years ago or something like that. <laughs> but but um, I remember I used to draw on the board these diagrams were like, okay, well, to know how to update, you know, your position, we need to, we need to know what the current orientation is. And so we would talk about head direction cells and grid cells and they have to be combined together to figure out a new position. We, we, it, but we, there was no obvious way to do this in the neuron. And that, that's what we're referring to here. Um, so I just point out, this is a problem we've known about for a long time. Um, and so uh, we have to solve it. But I, I, I think, I'm trying to think what you just said, Subhutai, it didn't quite, it didn't, I understand what you, the word you said, but I didn't understand how it might relate to the solution here, but it might, I, I'm intrigued by that. Um, um, it, it, I mean, I guess I was reacting, like you said, well, we have to combine the different uh, vectors. That is true. Um, uh, that, to understand the whole SDR, but somehow we have to, it's a complex formula that's saying, oh, given the entire SDR of movement vectors, how should each individual vector get updated? Is a little challenging. I mean, because these updates are path integration and path integration has to follow a set of simple rules, uh, these voltage controlled oscillators. So I don't know. Anyway, I think it's the right questions in, mm -hmm. in, in these, in some sense the trick to getting all this work is to figure out the answer to these questions. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll jump up to another one of these. Um, I, so we can look at this one. I have not read this one yet. So, uh, so hey, Marcus. Marcus dropped. I thought it was me that dropped out. It was Marcus that dropped no, out? No, no. Yeah, I think I can tell because everyone else is moving on the Zoom. Uh, uh, hey, Marcus, you so now? you dropped out. You have. You, you, hear me you should start over again. Can you hear I'm me starting right, right on James Bowery's question. Cool. Uh, so yeah, I'll start reading this. Anyone can feel free to jump in, and then I'll then I'll have maybe some thoughts at the end. So um, so when Marcus mentioned the constant time and sets, uh, it, it it occurred to me that overcomplete basis sets of linearly related vectors can be thought of as 
such only after the space they collectively identified has been in some sense compressed from their illusory independence. Uh, so I think there's some relation between this and the other one we read. Uh, so the, the time correlation between motions along two vectors is a first order compression that identifies a space that is in some sense allocentric relative to each of the egocentric vectors. Adding more vectors may or may not increase the allocentricity, decreasing the relative egocentricity, depending on whether the additional vectors provide additional information. And to break this down into its more primitive question, how might two mini columns measure their time correlated flows and thereby contribute to the identification of their, of their higher order space? Uh, as I read this, my reaction is I totally agree that like there has to be some sort of, you have a bunch of these many columns, a bunch of these you know, vectors, and you're trying to figure out the relation between them. Uh, that kind of goes in line with the other one, uh, with the other comment. Um, this use of the word egocentric and allocentric, I would say, honestly, we're still figuring out how to use those words in this, in this um, m mindset. Uh, what is the meaning of allocentric in, the, in this space that doesn't align precisely to physical space? I, I'd, I'd say we're still trying to figure out how to use those words. Well, I, don't, I didn't understand this comment right now. So, um, I mean, it's, uh, the language is a bit confusing to me. Um, but I, what, in some sense, you know, as, I was, uh, as I was commenting on Slack this morning, um, you know, one way to think about it is I think every column and every mini column in some sense has to convert between two spaces. That's sort of like the, the core operation of in the brain is you have a, a representation in one space and you have, to, you have to do a transform to a representation in another space. So from allocentric to egocentric is one and the other might be like our compositional objects. Um, so th that comment that somehow this could solve the allocentric to egocentric problem is really intriguing, but I didn't understand the comment. So does anyone else understand how we could do that? Yeah, I know, Mark, if you just said we don't really understand how to use those words, but um, we have some sense of them. So basically the question is, does this explain somehow how do we go between two spaces <laughs> that are positional and rotationally uh, different? I think I think he's using the words a little differently. Uh, when you think of all the okay, you have say 150 mil mini columns in a column or something like that. Each of those, well, that's a 150 dimensional representation. Uh, it's an overcomplete basis set, but to uh, so in some sense you can collapse it down to a lower dimensional space. And when he's talking about time correlations, he's talking about that uh, how you ca you can collapse it but done by realizing these two column these two many columns are kind of correlated they have some kind of time correlation but who where is it being collapsed why am i collapsing it uh is there a representation of the collapsed space or? well just we have some low dimensional location space uh that you have that you're updating a location you're updating that location but you have 150 many columns uh so 150 possible directions. You have to have some kind of relation between them. And I think that's, that's what he's using the word allocentric and egocentric to refer to going to the 150 dimensional direction to the lower dimensional direction. Mm. Oh, that's you know, a very different definition of ego. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. But I think, so, I think yeah. that's the way he's using it. Yeah. So it's you more know, like just, a projection. Yes. Just, a, just a, an interesting comment here. I would say, let's say we have 200 mini columns in the 200 dimensions. Uh, we don't use them all. I mean, in the, in the cortex, we would subsample from them, right? We might only sample 10 or 20 of those or even less. If you sample the spatial pool and the mechanisms we come up with say like, if I want to recognize a point in space, I don't need to look at all of them. Um, uh, in fact, there, there's this sort of balance in learning which says like, yes, I could get a more, more uh, finely tuned dimension. You know, I could represent a huge space of possibilities, but in reality, we don't connect all, right? We'd only connect to some sub small subset of them. And I just pointed that out that just because mathematically it represents that, but if a cell is going to read out a location, it's going to connect to a very small subset of all those possible 200 dimensions. And um, it, it's, it goes back to like our, uh, our, our frameworks paper, um, where we talked about, yeah, hey, if you have grid cell modules, the more grid cell modules you have, the bigger your representational space is. So you want to have enough grid cell modules, which are equivalent to the mini columns in this case. Uh, you want to have enough grid cell modules, but after some point, getting more and more and more, it doesn't really help you too much. It just gets you, you know, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't sample from all of them, I guess. So, 
um, and I just I want to point that out that just because you have this high order thing, um, um, it doesn't mean we have to rely on all. We don't have to. Just, we reduce the space by just connecting to fewer of them. Maybe that's the way to put it. Anyway, I'll go back to my point earlier. Is I think the it, I, just the core problem we have to solve is how does a column and many columns um, convert between one space and another space and position and rotation. Um, and I think this is going on, as I said in Slack this morning, I think this is like very likely that you're gonna have one representation in the upper layers of the cortex and another representation in the lower layers of the cortex. That's why we have these broad receptor fields, these narrow receptor fields. That's why we have um, you know, the two different um, sets of complex cells, the upper and lower layer. Um, so I think that's part of the solution, even though we don't understand the solution. Okay, uh, and okay. Uh, just, uh, this is pretty quick and just see if this generates any reactions. So uh, he says one small, this is another commenter, one small suggestion or comment. Uh, you will know if the new ideas are right if the math is simple. For example, I think you are reaching for a concept, a vector with location and amplitude, which are independently comparable dimensions and that beautiful sparse representation that you integrate with. I think there are kind of two statements here. I, th I feel like if I could put, put words in Jeff's mouth, he, like this, the sentiment here uh, makes sense. Like he might not say the math is simple, but like the idea we're trying to find this underlying simple idea. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. I would say uh, putting other words in Jeff's mouth. <laughs> those are the ideas are right if we fit a whole set of biological constraints or cons and fundamental constraints. Um, you know, regardless of whether the math is simple or not, like if there's fundamental properties we need to match and it, there's biological constraints and if we can match both of those things, then we kind of know the ideas are right. Yeah, I, that's all right. Yeah. In fact, I think that the problem is that, again, I think I agree with both of you. So uh, you, you can put the words back on now. But it, it, it isn't the math that has to be simple. It's the ideas have to be simple. There has to be an elegant solution. And, and all, you know, discoveries, there's a huge benefit for having a, you know, a simple copacetic explanation. Um, what's it, what's it, there's a name for that. Um, you know, the Occam's razor. The Occam's, Occam's razor, razor, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, but I agree. It doesn't have to be math. At least it doesn't work for me in the math. Um, the math may not be simple, but the idea has to be simple. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I think we should thank James, Don, and Elias for watching and everybody else. Meeting. That sounds like they've been uh, looking at. Hopefully, it's not too confusing for them. And um, <laughs> and uh, keep the questions coming. I just I, I just want to make sure they don't expect it just because we're having a research meeting that we understand this stuff. I mean, that's that that was the point of when we started, you know, sharing our research meetings. We're like people are gonna, people are going to realize how how little we understand about some of this stuff. Well, that's kind of the essence of, then it wouldn't be a I, I know, it's it the benefit be talk. Of, right? So most people, are, so I just want to let people know that just because we're presenting something doesn't mean you understand it. Yeah. That's the point of the research. Thing. All right, I'm going to switch. We're going to do my little article now. Is that is that it or is there something else to? Yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can go and ahead. I also wanted to show uh, uh, a couple of charts from that uh, paper. You want to do that first? Um, sure, yeah, because it, yeah, it might first. relate uh, more directly to Monday's meeting. Um, Are we still recording? Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, so the first thing was this um, um, thing on the aperture problem that I just pointed out on Slack. And we were talking about what can a single receptive field or neuron kind of deduce about the motion. And this is supposed to, I think, say, okay, if you just have a small visual field and, and you're seeing this motion, you don't actually know how the underlying object is moving. So imagine there's some like vertical line here and it looks like yeah. it's kind of moving this way, but it could be moving sideways. I don't know if I'm uh, pointing at the camera correctly, <laughs> but it could be moving, you know, horizontally, but, or, or, you know, just slightly obliquely and you would still see something like this. It just would be at different speeds. So without knowing kind of the global context around it, you can't actually tell which direction the actual object is moving. Uh, so that kind of led to the question of how we measure these receptive fields and whether they take, into, take this into account. Uh, so I wanted to show this, a couple of figures from this paper. Um, this actually answers a couple of questions. Well, it answers another question that came up in the meeting too. So, um, so this is a paper by Alessandra Angelucci, who was actually at our Banbury workshop. Oh yeah. And so she has a really nice paper on 
feed forward connections, lateral connections and feedback connections and how they kind of relate to what we think about receptive fields. Uh, this is a 2006 paper, so it's relatively recent. Um, so basically what they measure is, if you look at kind of the stimulus, um, a lot of times what they will do is start with a really small stimulus and then keep increasing the diameter of the stimulus and measure the neuron's response as a, as a that's the, that's the typical method. That's the typical yeah, method. Yeah. And then when you see the actual orientation tuning curves, they'll pick some point on this. Yeah, curve. They, they, they either pick the point where you get the maximum response, um, or then if, it, if the response goes down, then they'll say that's an end stop cell. Yeah, uh, you know, get wider. Hard to get like effect of the surround. Or, I yeah, think so that, that would be like, called an end stop cell, I think that one. Yeah. Uh, this might not be end stop. It could be just uh, the line is like increasing. Uh, yeah, but they, they make the line wider and wider and wider, right? And usually it just plateaus. It's at some point the, the response doesn't go up anymore. Yeah. And then, and then at that yeah. point, they say that's the size of the receptive field. But if yeah. it starts to go down, then they say, "Oh, that's an end stop." Meaning there's a. It, it's if you get bigger than that, then it 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 starts declining. So it's like it, it has this preference for a, because most of the cells that are that are not end stop, they just plateau. That's my understanding. Is that different than your understanding? I think uh, she's saying they almost always all go down when you get more information from the surround. Well, that's uh, that is the definition of an end stop cell. So I thought. I didn't think that would, I don't think that's, I don't know, that's hmm. inconsistent with what I understand. What, what do you, what, to me, end stop means like their line has stopped somewhere. No, end stop means end stop. they keep making the line wider. So you start off like, okay, it's, a, I don't know, two millimeters, and then three millimeters. And, and so it's moving, it's a moving line, right? Or, uh, or it's not moving either way, but um, uh, typically moving. And then, and they keep, they figure out the size of the receptive field they watch the response to the cell, and as it gets wider and wider, the cell is spiking faster and faster. And at some point, it stops spiking faster. At that point, they say that is the size of the receptive field. Um, but some cells, as you get even wider beyond that, start to decrease. Other cells just say, nope, I'm just, I reached my maximum, and, um, and so I'm not paying attention to stuff at okay. longer further away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. That that that's consistent with this. Yeah, exactly. But I think end stop cells are only seen in the upper layers of the cortex, if I recall. Um, and so, yeah, so that is, she's saying this is the tuning of a typical V1 cell. Well maybe she uh, thinks typical V1 cells are end stop cells. I don't know. Or maybe I maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think uh, I remember her saying that like Hubel and Weasel actually use the smallest one, the smallest response they can get, but Typically, I think people use the largest response, um, and that is kind of the, the RF. Um, how, how, how can you distinguish between um, kind of two different things here in the sense that if in the upper layers there is, you know, the detection that there is an end stop, in other words, it's, it's, it sees the ends terminate, so it knows where, where the, uh, the line stops, that can be fed back to the lower levels to kind of modulate that activity. How can you, how can you tease that apart with the fact that with, with the original definition that Jeff was describing for end stop? I don't, I don't understand that, Kevin. What's the difference? <clears throat> you, you're, you, in your example, you were focusing on, they make the line wider and wider. I'm not, what, it, longer and longer, I'm not, not, not thicker. Yeah, I, longer I and longer. Okay. Like a bar, and it, I'm just making the bar longer, not okay. thicker. Okay. So you Maybe make I it. Misspoke. Okay. Uh, no, it was my interpretation what dimension you meant by uh, wider and wider. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so if you assume that you know you make it. Okay. So then, what you're saying is, is that, is that something is is tapering off the response, but is it is it intrinsic to that <clears throat> V1 uh, neuron? Or is it the fact that the upper levels are communicating down to well, it? Yeah, so part of this paper, and, and part of the, the, I think the conventional wisdom is it's not the cell, it's a network property. Once you get beyond a certain amount that there's inhibition coming in or maybe feedback from above and stuff. And that's partly what they're trying to tease out in this paper. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, 
it's, so exactly. That's, I mean, that's it's, the it's question: if it's, a, if it's horizontal inhibition or whether it's coming. Uh, uh, from, I, I don't think they're, they don't make that distinction. They just say, it just say this is the response of the cell, and so we're going to characterize the cell. But there's a lot of debate about well, how do how do these properties arise from you know what, what what the cortex is getting from the thalamus. The input is not or it's it's generally thought not to be line oriented these are these are center surround cells so, so the cortex has to figure out you know what's the orientation the cortex has to figure out what's the what the speed is the cortex has to figure out what's the you know why some cells are complex and some are simple and why if some are end stops and some not end stops so that's all some sort of network property in the cortex itself and uh, there's a lot of debate about how these things come about so no one, yeah. I don't think very few people think, oh, it's just the cell. It's like a cell plus it's in surrounding immature neurons. And so yeah, and here in this paper, and I'm not really prepared to go into this paper in depth today, but they're trying to tease out the feedback, the impact of the feedback connections, the impact of the inhibitory connections and the long range lateral connections. What, uh, and I think they're proposing specific, like they say, they propose specific mechanisms for uh, this, this to happen. So I'm not, I'm, that's not, I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, just sort of saying how they measure these responses. Um, and this diagram kind of captures what I, what I said. The second diagram I wanted to show was, um, they, they, she has a diagram which shows oh, nice. where the magno parvo cells terminate in V1. Oh, this is um, a great diagram. And so these black, this is the LGN and these black ones are parvo and the white ones are magno cells and showing that the magno terminates in uh, five, six, and in four C alpha, <laughs> layer four C, and parvos, uh, parvo cells uh, you know, are segregated in V1, and they're in the lower part of four C, and also in the lower part of the uh, so, layers five, six. So at least the good thing, I mean, the thing is they are segregated. Uh, yes, so by the way, so uh, I mentioned this on Monday, um, the classic view is, as I showed in that diagram on Monday, that there are three different areas where thalamic input enters a column. And classically, it's said it, it's the bottom of layer three, um, the bottom of layer five, and layer four. You can see and, there's like this thin connection arrow here. Yeah. So, my... so, and, and so in this, so as some people have argued, and maybe because of this kind of diagram, that in the striate, visual cortex where they have these 4a, 4b, and 4c, or alpha and beta, whatever they are, um, that that's miscorrectly identified. That they, they, that's just not the right, the reason they did that is because they saw this input and saying, oh, it has to be layer four. There's no reason you have to call it four. They, just, and so people, some people argued that this is a mislabeling. And um, that really that upper line from, um, uh, uh, the, 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 here they're showing two magnocellular layers, that one of those could be like the equivalent of lower layer three. Um, and so maybe, I read this, some might argue that what, they, what they're calling striate layer four is not striate layer four at all. It's really, it's, it's a striate layer three. Uh, and it's purely arbitrary how, how you decide to do that. But based on this diagram, I would agree with that. I would agree that like, oh, well that, if, if that upper uh, magnocellular input is really representing the equivalent to most cortical regions that would be lower layer three then what what's labeled there as 4c should be uh you know or something like 4c alpha or 4b alpha is really the lower layer three so we should not pay attention to this fours there that, that, that's that's just arbitrary um and what's what's 4c beta is really what's typically considered layer four and that 4b alpha would be con uh, lower layer three and, and that would make it consistent with other cortical columns that don't have these uh, extra striate uh, layers there. Um, so uh, I think that came up on Monday's uh, conversation. Um, this is see this is a great diagram. I have to spend some time looking at this. Um, it, it's it's showing these dotted lines going up to the other layers. What are those dotted lines? So um, the so the dotted lines are feedback. Oh, well, feedback, feedback. Yeah. So like from V two, there's feedback. From layer two, three, and layer six, I guess, or layer five, six, yeah. back down. And so, like when they show in V two and V four, uh, they're not showing any input to layer four. On, on V two, they're not showing any input to layer 
Um, They're not showing any inputs to Laravel 2 at all. It's just um, a V1 centric view of okay. feedback. So, into the, so let's look at then uh, V3 and I don't know what the one at the top of the diagram, it's, it's truncated. Um, what is that top, the next region up, what the one is not labeled, I can't see, there you go, V5. Um, MT. Yeah. MT. So classically, um, the feed forward input, um, they're showing them different in these different diagrams. I don't understand that. I mean, the classic diagram you see everywhere, there's these three inputs, layer four, bottom layer three, bottom layer five. They're not showing those here. They're showing various things. They're showing the- uh, They're only showing the projections from V1 to these layers and I the projections see. into V1. So it's completely V1 centric. They're, and not, they're showing. not showing, and they're probably not showing any connections that go through the thalamus, which are really the ones we're concerned about. Not, right? not for other layer. Are yeah, from V1 to V3 and V1 and V3 to V5, the connections we're really concerned about are the, you know, the, the thalamic projections. Yeah, which are not shown here. Not shown here at all. So this is a little bit confusing. Um, but, um, well, that can make it a lot of confusing because people just ignore the Sherman and Guillory idea that Thomas. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, they're not, they're not claiming to show inputs into V3 or V2, yeah, it. just the outputs from V1 and into V1. Anyway, this is an interesting diagram. I should sit there and try to digest it, perhaps. Is yeah, it? And, and we could tr see if, you know, we can have her on the call at some point. Maybe. Uh, yeah. I think she'd, well, she'd love to talk about this stuff. Well, are you, would you just send a link to that in the Slack? And then yeah, I'll do that. Um, or maybe there's Michelangelo. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Michelangelo say he was leaving to go to the conference? <laughs> yeah, then he came back. <laughs> he came back. I guess it wasn't He's, that interesting. He must have found the first talk not very interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, that's good. That's interesting. Yeah, but you, your point showing this diagram is that the magnetic layers are, are, are at least kept separate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Okay. Uh, anything else? All right, I'm going to share my screen then. Um, and, um, and then I'm going to jump to um, this. Can you see this paper? Yeah, we see it. Yeah. All right. So um, I was just reading papers yesterday and uh, I came across this one. I don't know how I came across it. Uh, and it's a recent paper. It's, it's May of 2020. Uh, the basic idea, uh, it's, a, it's a complex, it's very detailed and complex and well written, but uh, it's, it's not all authors. Uh, Kay is the first author and um, Frank is the last author here. Um, and I'll try to just summarize it in a picture here. I'm not going to go through the whole paper. But there's just a couple of things I thought were interesting. The basic idea for this paper is they were trying to, um, you know, we've talked about the precession in like grid cells and place cells, where as an animal approaches a location, um, the cells that encode that location first start firing at the latter part of the theta phase. And as the animal moves through the location, the point at which that cell fires moves to the earlier part of the theta phase. Um, so where it's occurring in the theta phase depends on where the animal is relative, is it moving, is it moving towards the location or is it moving away from the location? And one interpretation which they use in this diagram is that um, that is a prediction. So when a cell is firing late uh, in the theta phase, like you haven't gotten to the point yet, it's like a prediction, like I'm gonna get there soon. Um, and then they've, it's been shown previously that these, there, there can be different, um, uh, in some sense, hypotheses of what the animal might be thinking or, or the different choices it might be making. So if the animal is going to make a choice, you would see, it, you'd see both of these representations in the, in the later part of the theta phase. It's like, I haven't chosen yet, but, you know, what cell firing is like, which place I'm going to be in is dependent, is going to be determined in the future. And so, there might, you know, that there might be a, um, multiple cells firing in that later part of the theta phase saying, I have multiple predictions of what might occur. So here's a, a rat, you can see my cursor, I hope, moving down this race, he's gonna turn left or turn right. And right is represented by pink and left is represented by gray. And this is a, a conceptual drawing of what they're talking about here. Um, if, 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 a, if a cell represents a grid cell, uh, or in this case, it was a play cell, so there may be pink play cells and gray play cells, depending on whether the animal's on the left side here or the right side here. Those are the play cells representing, on, are they on this side of the maze or on this side of the maze? And there's different ways you might find uh, encoding. So along this timeline, the animal is going from left to right in time, 
it's approaching the, approaching the, the bifurcation point in the maze, that's where the dotted line is, and then after that, it's made its choice. So they're saying, hey, there's various, these place cells could do different things. Like a place cell could only fire when the rat had made the choice and it's in that location. So that's pure localization. This, the place cell could fire in a, at, the, at the latter part of the phase as it's approaching. Like, hey, it's pure predicting. I'm predicting I'm going to make going down the left side of the maze. And I did go down the left side of the maze. There's another alternate that could be where you have a place cell that represents the left side and place cell that represents the right side of the cell side, and they're both firing as you approach the point. And once the rat makes a choice, then only the one that's accurate files, fires. And then there's another possibility, which is that there's sort of what they call a, they use a regenerative meaning like a prediction. Um, it says, oh, maybe I got some occasionally the, 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 the left place cell firing, occasionally the right place cell firing, but then once I've made my choice, then it's only the correct one. And then this is what the paper is all about. What they've discovered is often it looks like this one on the right, the cycling, where as the rat is approaching the point where it's going to make its choice, um, every other theta cycle, you'll see a gray and a, and a pink and a gray and a pink. It's like, so every, this is at eight hertz, so every 133 milliseconds, you'll see the left place cell, then the right place cell, then the left place cell on alternate phase cycle. So the gist of this paper was to show that this alternating um, uh, 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 hypothesis or alternating predictions are occurring, um, and they occur in this sort of alternating every other theta cycle. So before I go on, is that, was that a clear explanation? Was any questions about that? Was it clear? Can you guys um, hear me? Does this happen uh, throughout the, uh, before, the throughout the whole tunnel before the bifurcation? Yeah, it, yeah, I, I forget the exact thing. details, but yes, they're recording these cells. Um, you know, the, the real details are down here. You can see under E type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, where was the place cell firing? Well, it, it, at this point, it's firing before it got to the, the turn, and then it fires when it's over here. So it's not throughout the entire maze, it would be over this little area of the maze, or this area of the maze, that kind of thing. So it's close to the actual decision well, it's it's somewhere. I don't know. You have to think about the dimensions here, and um, right, yeah, right. I mean it's close, but it's not like it's not like right at that point. Look at the red cell here; it's firing throughout most of this. Like, okay, today. it's very variable then. Okay, it's a bit variable. Okay, yeah. cool. Thanks. There's lots of data in this paper. I I, I couldn't absorb it all. Uh, they look they look at this many many different ways: um, different cells, different locations, single cells, multi cells at the same time. Um, they, they kind of beat this thing, you know, this idea, they did a very thorough job. I've been putting a positive spin on it, it's very thorough. Um, I want to just, I'm not going to take you through all these things. Um, these are all basically lots of different flavors of the same, <laughs> same idea. Um, uh, but I do want to um, jump to a couple of things I thought were interesting. Um, and, and that was here, um, they were talking about hedge erection cells as well. And so, uh, and this is the reason I brought this up and I mentioned this um, on Slack. He said, unexpectedly, single cell analysis indicated that theta phase also governed the well-established hippocampal representation of heading direction. So what they, they found that, and I guess I, I sound like no one knew this before, but head direction cells exhibit the same behavior. The head direction cells will exhibit the precession. Head direction cells will sort of predict the different alternate um, ways the head's going to move. Um, and, um, and they say down here, firing in the non-preferred direction is consistent with representation of the non-current or hypothetical direction. So they're saying the, the, throughout the phase cycle, you'll see different head direction cells become active depending on the possible future ways the head might turn. Um, so that, I just thought it was an interesting little um, um, supporting piece of evidence of this idea that I mentioned on Monday, that head direction cells are really maybe just another dimension. And, they're really being treated the same way as uh, grid cells. Um, they're, they're basically the same. It's just that we're, they're basically there's a path integration along some uh, movement vector. And so it does, and, and that beyond that, they're the same. This doesn't prove that, but it supports that idea. And then they sort of generalize that. They said the generalization of intracycle, uh, intracycle coding to direction suggested that other correlates might be similarly organized via phase. Indeed, extending our analysis, we observed equivalent theta phase 
coding for additional representation of firing patterns in the hippocampus. So basically they're saying this idea that all these cells that they're finding in the hippocampal complex, whether they're classic place cells or grid cells or head direction cells, uh, seem to be uh, working on the same basic idea. Um, uh, and so it says, they don't prove that in this last quote, I, I say it raises the possibility that theta phase organizes non-locational representations across entire populations of hippocampal neurons. So that's all I wanted to say about this, um, unless someone has questions about it. It, it is just just from the angle of um, having seen a lot of papers on good cells and head direction cells and seeing what the firing fields of individual cells look like. Uh, this is enlightening or this is um, knowing that something like this is going on underneath provides a lot of insight on how those on what those fields actually are. Uh, when we when we see the like this heat map of where a grid cell fires or what directions a head direction cell fires, it's kind of noisy and strange. Uh, but then you realize it's because they're averaging a bunch of time together. Where what actually was happening during that time was a a rat or mouse was um, was always it was moving around. It was considering it had is considering different paths. It was it had different decision points. So sometimes this head direction cell has this wonky tuning, but that's because while the rat was behaving, uh, it was considering turning different directions. That's a good observation. It, you're, yeah, yeah, you're saying that a lot of the noisiness of these things really could be because they weren't accounting for phase, uh, of where it occurred in the theta phase, and even where which which theta phase it occurred in. Uh, I, I think that's what you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if somehow you were ma if somehow you magically knew the internal state of the rat, like what it was thinking about, what it was yeah. considering doing right now. It would it would give you a it would, it would remove a lot of the noise. Noise would no longer look like noise. It yeah. would it would look like it's tracking you know what the what the rat's considering doing right now. Yeah, you're right because you see these cells, these place cells are firing. That the rat is not in these places, but these place cells are firing, and and and, and yet it is consistent with a, a a deeper understanding of what what's going on. Is that it's considering those as a future location. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that in that way, but it would, it would perhaps explain a lot of the messy data that you'd see. I think to me, it's also, it, it, in the same reason I argued Monday, I think it's uh, enlightening to realize that, oh, well, all the mechanism we think about that, that this, uh, these voltage control oscillators that are the, the primary thesis about how this phase procession occurs, which, by the way, doesn't really explain the alternating future hypotheses. I don't understand that. Um, but, um, but whatever the mechanism is, it's gonna to apply to all these things. And so it, that, that itself is a simplifying idea, even though it's a complex mechanism, it's the same complex mechanism applied to everything. And therefore, in, in many ways, it, it unifies a, a lot of different things. And you say, okay, there's a simpler explanation behind it. This gets back to the comment we had earlier on, on the YouTube, uh, you know, some of the questions earlier, where I was saying that, um, you know, we don't understand this yet, but this is this is a simplifying idea um, that all these dimensions are sort of all these different things that we, we currently think are separate things are actually manifestations. At least grid cells and head direction cells are manifestations of the same stuff. And and as I argued on Monday, also that you know, there's a lot of conjunctive cells that are not pure grid cells, and not pure head direction cells. And they can also be explained in this way that maybe those are actually the primary uh, path integration modules and um, uh, different movement vectors and um, and what we what we classically think of a pure um, grid cell is actually not is an artifact. It's not pure. So anyway, I'm, I'm I'm spewing forth here. Hopefully, I don't talk too much. So that's it for me. And that's if anyone else has things on this paper, feel free. I might sh I'm going to share my screen and show something else real quick. But if it, but it, if you have anything else on this paper, anyone else feel free to ask questions now. Uh, I guess that's a no. So uh, I'm gonna bring up, um, I'm gonna show two things that are mostly, here, I'll start with the one that's, that has no words. There's a, there's a just a, uh, a video I wanna show you real quick because I think it's useful when thinking about flow. I've, I've just, I've mentioned this before, but I don't know if it's fresh on your mind. Uh, it's it's a, a, in a talk that Mike Hasselmo gave, um, he showed this video that's just, it's very vibrant, it's very vivid, it's, it's kind of stuck with me and it's useful to have in your mind when you think about flow. 
Uh, so I'm going to figure out how to share this. I'm going to share in so this special way. Every time we say we think about flow, I think about Florian. You know? <laughs> oh yeah, I think about flow, and he pops in my head. Oh, Florian, what, what are you doing? Cool. All right. <laughs> Zoom has this special sharing mode where uh, if you're sharing a video, you click this checkbox. So I made sure to do that. Oh, oh no. Where oh, is that? Uh, when you share a screen, there's a checkbox, at least on the Mac version. There might wow. be on the uh, on this. Uh, yeah, I've used it before. I think it uses a higher frame rate or something. Oh, interesting. Right, just making sure you can hear me right now, right? Yeah. Cool. I had to uh, change the setting. Okay. So, um, so what I'm going to focus you in on is uh, is this set of dots down here. I'm going to start playing it soon. Um, and actually, I'm curious right now. Does this set of dots look like anything to you right now? Does it look like random dots, or is no, there any got, 3D it, shape? It's got well, it does have 3D shape. It, it, to me, it looks like um, uh, three walls. Was a, okay, it, interesting. I see. So I, I wasn't sure. I've seen the video so many times, I didn't know if it would be parsable. Well, yeah, you know, I like wouldn't the, have said that until you asked me to look at it. Okay. When you asked me to look at it, then I said, "Oh, yeah, it's like I'm in a maze, and there's uh, there's a distant wall, and there's two side walls." Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to play the video in a second. When I saw this, it taught me something about optic flow. Uh, so I, I think you'll just see what I mean. So with Florian Rowdy's, we actually modeled how this could arise from the angle of visual features or optic flow. I'm going to pause for a second. Could you hear him talking right there? Or did you just yeah. see? Was that okay. Hasselhoff? Okay. Uh, yeah, that was Hasselhoff. I'll, I'll let him continue talking then, and I, I won't talk over it. Really, you can do, use either thing for um, coding location. You can, I made this movie with these random dots just to show how easy it is to get a sense of your location in an environment just based on either optic flow or feature angle. Uh, and we sh looked at the ground plane characteristics using template ma matching from the prone technique or features on the walls, so visual feature angle. Um, and we showed that we could separate his words weren't that important other than just giving you context. It's just when I think about flow, the fact that a bunch of dots moving around, we can just see the structure immediately uh, is interesting to me. And it's, it's like so it's like a design constraint in a sense. Well, that's, I mean, yeah, that, was, a... that was in some sense the genesis of this whole idea that we, we learn uh, dimensionality of space from mm -hmm. Uh, from this flow pattern, right? I mean, that's that was. Uh, I, I well, I'm not that. focusing on the 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 first person. I'm seeing a video game. The fact that even if it's just a bunch of dots, our minds just just part just process it. Uh, yeah, but there's is, a there's a ton of papers that explore this phenomenon and, and where it happens in like V1, MT, MST, and where this I think it's called like structure from motion. Um, and you you can see all sorts of structure just from pure random dots that are. That happen to have a coherent flow. So I don't know if that stuff is interesting or not. We could. Well, it definitely is interesting. I mean, I mean, to me, well, I maybe I should. This was a even though I talked about video games in the past, Marcus. That was clearly my point was that you don't have to know any of the features. Like to get the flow, none of the spatial features matter. That's the whole point, right? And the point is this: you should get the same dimensionality of the space regardless of whatever features are on. And that's when they show that the complex cells respond to. The random bit patterns is consistent with that. So I'm wondering if I saw this video before and I internalized it and didn't realize it, and then it came back subconsciously to me, because this is exactly what I was imagining. And maybe I saw Mike talk about these things. I, I can't recall that. Once a long time ago, I did share this video. So it, uh, it, uh, it's you know, there. I, I, you have a, you have a couple neurons devoted to this. <laughs> but I did not remember it at all. At least some dendrites. But <laughs> yeah. But this is a, this is a all right. So. So maybe I had already internalized this, so maybe this is maybe it's helpful for others. But, um, but that was when I talked about the flow bits, and I say they have to represent, you know, it basically just represent um, that the that the I had a diagram that said or a text that said, you know, the spatial patterns are relevant here. It all, in fact, you don't want to pay attention to them uh, because you want to you want to extract the same flow information regardless of what's actually being seen, and um, you don't, you know, because that defines the space, not the objects in the space. It's the, it's defined by the, the, the flow patterns, and then the actual things you see should not be flow dependent. They should be spatial patterns that that are there regardless of whether you're moving or not. And that, that was consistent with the um, um, the, the parvocellular cells. They where they had a constant response, um, and they were they were orientation tuned. So anyway, that's a great video, and I apologize to Mike Hasselmuller if I had forgotten that he'd already shown this. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> in Sumatai, you said there's a lot of literature on this. So I'm, I'm probably stepping into a field where people are far more expert than I am. Um, yeah, this is very, very heavily studied. Um, I just don't know if it's been correlated to many columns in the cortex. Um, I, I was not aware of that. I, yeah, I don't know about many columns. Uh, yeah, most of um, this, most of literature in general ignores many columns. But uh, yeah, I think this is more like populations recordings and you know neural recordings from different. If I wanted to read some of those papers, what do you suggest I would look for? Uh, I can send you uh, a couple of references. Uh, I think DeAngelis or Angelaki. I think there are a couple of. That would be very helpful. Papers. Yeah, I think I can I'm send just reading papers. I'm, I'm, and I'm gonna, I can take some papers with me over the next few days on vacation. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember in computer vision, people used to study this a lot because this is a way of extracting structure, um, you know, from moving yeah. from stimuli. Well, you know, I, a lot of what we do is, in some sense is, you know, uh, already been understood by somebody else in some other field. And, uh, but we came at it from a different direction. I, I, I remember that, that when I sent our frameworks paper to uh, Jeff Hinton, and he wrote back with that um, paper that he did like in the 80s about computer vision, talking about these reference frame problems. And, all, and it was like he had all the same comments and same observations, but he wasn't thinking about biology. He was thinking about just the mathematics of vision. Um, but he'd already thought of this same stuff a long time ago. Yeah, there's an analogous set of stuff, which is not talking about how you get a struct, uh, how you get, I guess it's related. It's a subset of this is how you get depth from motion. You get a lot of depth cues uh, from motion as well. From motion. Yeah. yeah. Well here, you know, it's interesting, like as, as this image, you also get depth clues, even if it's a static image in this particular case, like if I saw those walls, you know. But this is a very clear, um, you know, converging lines, straight lines. Um, anyway, it's interesting. Well, thank, that was good. That was good to see, Marcus. Thank you. Marcus, I wondered. Uh, go ahead. Why? Yeah, a quick question. Just to make sure I understand. So, are you saying these dots are randomly placed in that Peter there, like randomly placed across the entire frame? Yes, randomly placed. I think probably their logic was like they they randomly placed them across the floor, across the walls. Uh, but then it just naturally occurs that uh, they get clustered because that's what happens in 3D space. I, I, that's not obviously how they get clustered, but it doesn't, I guess. What, okay. If, if you were in an, in an infinite plane, there were dots randomly placed on the ground, you would see them in, in the horizon, you'd just see a straight line of dots all connected, like it, like oh, asymptote, it would alias, whatever you want to call it. So they're going to yeah. get, dense, get denser right distance. Yeah, so you could see that yeah. right there in the floor, for example. Yeah. But, you know, there's no dots on the ceiling in this case, so. Um, True. Uh, so once a dot is placed, is it consistently placed, or are you saying it, it pops in and out? It's consistently placed. I'm almost positive. If it pops yeah. in and out, then you wouldn't be able to detect motion. Well, that was the density argument. I mean, if you could say, you know, you can look at it as still, you could say something about it. And yeah, might be but, well, that. that's what you can, right? It, obviously, the, the, the only way you can see any structure in here is the density changes in the, in the bits, right? But in right, motion, I mean, you don't, in you, motion, you, you don't spatially, need it's a, It can be a spatially density. I mean, I'm seeing some of these things, you know, flicker, but I mean, they're still popped back into the same position. But I'm just wondering, you could theoretically, if you use the density argument, you could keep moving them around, but you would see there would be a less, there would be a density gradient that would continue to be there regardless. Yeah, but you would get no, you get no motion. I would not necessarily, uh, at the boundaries, you would get a difference. And I think that's where, that's where it might be a, uh, you'd still be able to. It, it, it just, it just, like. there, there would, it, it's impossible to get motion if the, if you have random bits just popping in and out, would you get be like a, a series of still images and you could infer the motion from them, but there would be no inherent detection of motion, right? If, and, if, if what you're detecting is a difference in density, yeah. that is effectively a texture, and you can see boundaries in texture. And if those boundaries are shifting around according to, you know. Yeah, uh, okay. Remember the, uh, the paper I talked about a while back was, there was this pure random bit pattern. In fact, I think, I think you, could, you could achieve something similar here if you had a complete field of random bits, 
and um, and then they changed. They were they were flowing in different uh, uh, patterns on the screen. You would see a similar effect, meaning that there could be no. You don't actually have to have the density difference to make it work. I, I can tell I could tell if you're turning left or right or going forward or backwards, um, uh, purely or uh, purely based on a flow of a completely uniform distribution of random bits. In this case, you, you see structure, you see walls and things like that, but the motion movement itself could be, um, could be uh, inferred purely from a, a field of random bits. I mean, I'm, and there are papers that try to say whether the human visual system, you know, uh, it can certainly detect first order statistics or whether it can go to higher order statistics and, and detect boundaries in that uh, and whether, you know, we get any cues from that. But, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily relating to the biology of doing it, but just the fact from a perceptual point of view, what is it, you know, what kind of organizing things pop out at you when you're looking at something that would be normally incoherent like a random field. So there's there's a lot of interesting cues there as to as to you know what it is that we're able to uh, kind of collectively and, and say okay uh, these things somehow belong together and I'll start aggregating them along that belongingness and and we seem to be very creative in being able to do that. Okay, there's a second thing I was going to bring up that goes back to one of the YouTube comments. Uh, the YouTube comment made me think of a figure from a paper. So let's see. Um, I'm going to have to. By the way, just just an interesting observation. You brought that up in the video mode of sharing the screen, but the resolution yep. of the image was was lower. It was a blurry sort of re low resolution. So I'm wondering what they do is they just lower the video, the, the resolution of the video. Um, Possibly. Just, I don't know if you noticed that, but that it was ended. also a low resolution YouTube video. Oh, so it's hard okay. to say for sure. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, it's probably a little bit, uh, this is a technology discussion. It's probably yeah, a little bit similar to PNGs versus JPEGs and how one of them is like solid colors. The other is more of a compression. Uh, I think, okay. I'll move on. Uh, uh, I'll share this same window, but in non-video mode, I guess. Yeah, that would be the, that would be the way to find out, right? Be sure oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. No, I'm changing topics though. Okay. Right now I'm, uh, I'm going back to uh, this browser window. Um, the paper I'm bringing up right here is, um, my goal is to show this figure, but first I'm just gonna tell you what paper this is. This is the Rat Slam paper, where they built a robotic system using a grid cell module, essentially. Uh, and so this solves this problem or approaches the problem of simultaneous location mapping using is this one of the, grid cells. I remember we looked at some of these papers a long time ago. Is this one of the ones we looked at back then? Yes, yes. Okay. Some years ago we looked at this. Uh, and I'm a little bit wrong to say grid cells though, because it says 2004. So I may be mixing up details. Uh, anyway, there exists a RASLAM that uses something similar to grid cells. And the, the figure I'm going to show here is, uh, is they show this can their set of cells. That? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me. That's good. That window around. Yeah. Um, they show their set of cells without drawing the actual cells. Um, but what I want to focus on here is they 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 have a robot moving around in essentially a two D world. I mean, it has a three D camera, but it's only it only has the floor available to it. Uh, but their set of cells they use. Yeah, the, I mean, they have these X cells and these Y cells. Uh, that's like one dimension of them. Um, but then they, they have, for different orientations, 2D orientations, they have a third, a third dimension of cells. So, so they, they essentially simulate this, this big block of cells. And what I'm bringing up here is, um, this is- Are you like, saying these are like where the animal is on the X, Y coordinates and then- and then the third dimension is its its head direction. Is that is that what you yes mean? yes. So these are like these are like place cells in the on the each in each x y plane, but then they cycle through different orientations in the vertical plane. Correct. And another way to say it is that it's a conjunctive location yes. and orientation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like this so far. Okay. Good. Yeah. So um, so we're kind of exploring right now of making orientation into a spatial dimension, um, is that sort of. And 
so a set of questions come up. I think two main questions come up is, um, first of all, uh, does it have a wraparound property on the, on, the, on the orientation, where if you go far enough, it wraps around to, to properly capture the fact that if we rotate 360 degrees, we wrap around. Um, I, I have I, some, that, by the way, I have some thoughts about that. I did, yeah. I have been thinking about that a lot. I didn't bring it up Monday. I thought it was going to be confusing, but I, I, yeah. I'm happy to talk about that. Okay, I, I agree. It's one of the questions. And sometimes you've used examples, like if you closed your eyes, rotated 360 degrees and realized you weren't able to anticipate where you were, what direction you were facing. Uh, yeah. So you've talked about that in the past. Uh, I'll just bring up the second point was um, a subtlety here is, uh, you don't have to think about it for very long to realize this, but like, um, give, depending on where you are in this height, uh, depending on what the orientation is, the command move forward is going to cause the bump of activity to move in a different sideways direction here. Uh, if, if you're on the floor, say the move forward might yeah. move you at, uh, here. Yeah. But this, this, uh, this was just related to the, the question we had on, uh, from one of the viewers of YouTube. Exactly, yeah, this, that, that question is what made me think of this figure. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is the second thing that's gonna come into this is when we deal with these spaces, does, your, does this direction, this theta direction, this orientation direction influence how different flows update you in these other dimensions? Yeah. yeah the, so, these two questions are the ones that come to mind that we, that yeah. in, in our exploration, we could, we could like, I, I just, I just gave two questions. Uh, you could come up with like a two by two matrix and answer them in different ways and design systems based on each of those directions. It's just two fundamental questions. So, is that what you wanted to say about this? Yeah, that, that's all I had to say. I'm bringing well, up. I just, picture. I, I'll try to bring this up, up, go back to something I said earlier. So if you think about like uh, what the eye is observing, like just what the eye is observing, which is really a movement in, we might call body centric space or egocentric space, right? Like, um, um, so if, if, uh, if a movement forward, it maybe it's represented by X. Well, it's always going to be moving forward. It's just X is moving forward. It's not in the space of the world. It's in space of my body. So X is going forward and Y is going backwards and, and uh, theta, the, the vertical dimension here is turning left and right. There's no, there's no problem there um, because, um, but it's only, I think, um, when I want to translate this to, to the space of, an, of a room or space of an object or an external space that I have a problem. Um, where moving along X in moving forward in my body, which is always the same relative to my body, it's not always the same relative to the room or the object I'm observing. So to me, if I just look at the flow bits coming into the V1, they, are, they don't have a problem. They just represent movements in these directions relative to my body. They don't have to coordinate with each other. They don't have to, you know, Turning left is turning left no matter what. It's always turning left, no matter where I am relative to the world. And going forward is always going forward. It's when I want to translate this to the room or translate it to something else, which is the difficult. So to me, that this gets back to the problem. The, the really problem is we have these two spaces, the one that's defined by the flow bits, which is really just observing my behaviors, uh, but that is not relative to some external object or some external space. And we have to somehow figure out how to get from the body-centric, um, simple representation to um, to make this translation to some um, external space. Uh, I, I'm just rephrasing the problem and pointing out that it's really a two space problem. The space relative to the body does not have any issues with this whatsoever. It's just my flow is my flow, whatever I'm moving, that's what represents that. And it's really the problem of um, um, translating to another space. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by this. I think just defining the problem clearly is it's usually the path to under figuring out the solution. So I'm going to start thinking now very clearly about, okay, what if one of the, um, the upper and lower layers, or let's say the lower layers represent movement relative to my body. There's no ever inconsistency there. And by the way, layer five cells, which are the motor output cells are in the lower layers and they need to be body-centric behaviors, right? They have to be move forward. It's not like move in this direction in an object. So, so it's, it's very clear to me that the lower layers are gonna represent this body space. And it's somehow we have to go between that and the upper layers are representing another space. 
And I think there's going to be a generic mechanism for converting between one space and another space, whether it's a, an environment or a, an object that I'm looking at or you know, my finger touching something. I don't know what it is. It's, it's going to be like, okay, the cortex is going between space A and space B, and here's how it's going to do it. And we can apply that to lots of different problems. So to me, that, that sort of crystallizing the problem a bit. Um, now we can just sort of noodle over the different ways this could happen. It's, it's a very tricky, tricky, but I think the answer is in the end, it's not going to be tricky. It's just tricky to think about. Anyway, so this is a helpful diagram. Okay, I'll stop sharing unless anyone wants to still see this. Uh, and if anyone else has anything, speak up. No, this turned out to be a longer research meeting than we thought. <laughs> Sorry. That was great. I love it. It's great. Very helpful. <laughs> totally helpful. Right, I'm curious done? what sort of YouTube comments we'll get now. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to get flooded with YouTube comments. No. <laughs> it's hard enough. To and and we, we're not promising we're going to respond to that. Yeah, anymore. it's hard enough having the time to think about anything here. You know? Yeah. We yeah, all have a lot to think there, I will respond to it. Anyway, anyway, it's great. Well, that was a fun day. Fun, exciting. All right, I guess we'll all see right. each other in a bit. I'll see you all later. All right, bye. Bye.